I'm Charlotte Davenport. I'm here in the village of Woodstock at the edge of the green with the cars going by, active little village, with uh, Katie Rundy, who's a new artist, showing in this room. You'll be seeing her paintings that are surrounding us very soon. This gallery is now a part of artistry in South Pomfret, which has been a, a real hit around our community. Lots of young people in the afternoon, afternoon school programs, all kinds of courses being taught, including drawing by Katie. Wonderful ceramic studio. I've been involved hanging out over there and taking open studio classes and mosaics myself, and I love it. And I'm so glad to see them in the village of Woodstock, where more people will be more aware of South Pomper, but will have the opportunity to come in here and see the paintings of the members of Artistry community and featured artists such as Katie in this particular room. Okay. I'm so glad you're here, Katie. I'm glad you're back in this part of the world. <laughs> I know you were in New Hampshire for a little bit and you grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, I think. I grew up in, well, my parents live in Hartford now. Oh. I grew up in upstate New York, in Rochester. And you love it here, and I know that. Yes, yes. And that makes me happy, because we all want you to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to stay, too. Uh, Katie works as a painter, a teacher. She um, does some spiritual work of her own. She has some, uh, a degree or some study in, um, what would we call it? Um, a master's in religious studies. Yes, a master's in religious studies. It's a wonderful combination for someone to come into a community with all those talents and feelings. And I, I think when you come to see her show, you will see that. You're also a saxophone player. I spotted her at a wonderful party, at a friend's son's engagement party, and was delighted to see her in that role, and I had no idea. <laughs> People in town know about you, too even little kids, because the Vermont Standard had a picture of Katie and the crew that were out in Colorado, and they won, what was the name of that festival? Um, the U.S. National, the Snow Sculpture Nationals in uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. And you had done flurry here, too, on the green. Yes, yes. love to do the flurry here. So yeah. those of you who've enjoyed the flurry on the green, this is one of the artists who's made that beautiful. I'd like to know how you ended up here. Oh, well, um, about 10 years ago now, um, I, actually no, let's, let's take that back to before I went to grad school, in between the summer, the summer in between my undergraduate um, in Ireland and my grad school years in Chicago, um, I went to uh, help out on a friend's farm in Corinth. Oh, that's a so, yeah. Rural, very rural compared to Woodstock. I love Corinth. Oh, I have friends over there. Beautiful, and it's up so high. There's just something special up there. Yeah. And um, after a summer of milking cows and wrapping cheese and stacking hay, I got to Chicago and saw the bathtub ring around the city and was like, I don't know if I can do this. And tell us about the trip to Ireland. Well, actually, I lived in Ireland. Um, for about three and a half years, I did my undergraduate there. Um, and what was the name of the university? University College Cork, so down in the south. Um, I had started my undergrad at Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York, and the program is so intense. I realized once they put treble clefs in the waffle irons in the, um, in the dining hall that there was no room for anything but music there, and so I started my undergraduate over again in Ireland, um, where you do it three years, not four, and it's a lot cheaper for American um, than going to school in America. So what a wonderful find! Uh, yeah, it was. It was great, and um, I did a folklore undergraduate there, which is hard to find around here as well. And that was really nice. Yeah, explain that. Uh, folklore is um, very, it, it's kind of like an offshoot of anthropology, um, where anthropology is more about like systems. Um, folklore is very, I mean, you think about anthropology going to a very different place. Looking at, you know. That this inspires picture making and sculpture. Uh, and certainly, yeah. Yeah. And movement and dance. And did you continue with your music when you were in Ireland? I did, yes. I was ready to quit by the time I went there because mm -hmm. just only doing music for two years was really draining me dry. But um, once I got there, I found it again. Um, I went up playing a lot around town. Um, well, and in Ireland, they have more of those kinds of places, probably, too. Yes. Especially in the South. Very good support for musicians. Um, 
very good. And I wound up playing a bunch of different kinds of music. Most people think, Ireland, you have Irish traditional music, but I played in an eight-piece funk and soul band for the most part. Oh, also a salsa band for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So you're creating your own <laughs> myths and stories and music and become a full-time artist. Yeah. What a wonderful background. Yeah, I'm, really, I'm very thankful for the diversity yeah. of it. Yeah. What, what was the painting teacher like? You had a painting teacher? Yes, my teacher I'd like Evan, to hear about him. Evan Wilson down in Hoosick Falls. Um, wonderful teacher. He's been um, very much a teacher and mentor to me. Um, what, he's a great realist painter. You don't run into him much in this area. Most of his work you find in the south. Um, he's represented in galleries in California and Florida and Nantucket, like out beyond. Mm -hmm. um, but I used to drive down to Music Falls once a week, every week for two nice. years. What a wonderful break for you. So it was a mentor incredible. and a teacher. Yeah. And do you feel connected to his aesthetic or have you broken into another one? Um, I feel like conceptually I come from a different place, but aesthetically I love what he does. And I, I chose... I, I asked him for instruction because I love his work so much. I remember seeing it at one point and being like, oh, I want to paint like that. Yeah. It's great when you can find a teacher that respects your way of seeing things. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. the skills, obviously. When we look at these paintings, everyone will understand that this is remarkable realistic painting. It's not like photorealism. It doesn't feel pop. It doesn't feel old. It feels like a new form to me. And I, I like realistic painting, and I even really love photorealism and the kinds of things that came out of that. This has a more mystical, gentle feeling. And I think I understand a little bit more about it when you talked about the, the photo, for example. Mm -hmm. The personalities, the spaces that I see in this work have stories. And I think a kind of soulful element. Oh, cool. Everything in this room feels good to me. So. I like knowing that this comes from Ireland, it comes from your family. Also, I know, mm -hmm. though, tell us about your family and their artistic lives and language. <laughs> <laughs> so my family is all English majors, mm -hmm. um, medievalists. My sister's a librarian, a uh, rare books librarian at Columbia. Um, she oh. works with their medieval manuscripts. Oh. Um, after years and years and years and years and years of intensive training. <laughs> I would imagine. Pretty. Pretty cool. Um, I'm the only person in my family who has never learned any old English. Oh, poor you. <laughs> Dropped the ball. <laughs> well, it's, it's a wonderful background. It maybe adds again to this almost mysterious, ageless thing as well. And I'm not saying it's not modern. Because to me, <laughs> no, to me, I, I'm serious. People who are breaking through with, with new ways to do pictures, mm -hmm. to create things that we all are familiar with to bring us into spaces that actually kind of exist in our own lives. Yes. I love that. Yeah. And so I think uh, all the people I've spoken to who've come here who are artists, and I've been an artist here for 58 years, so I know a lot of artists, and people are raving about it. Oh, good. We need people to come by them, too. That, that definitely I helps think them keep coming. The problem <laughs> is right now that I think when people first see things, it takes a while for it to become part of their desire. But this work is also work that would be um, a blessing in a house, not a, uh, the, you have to come see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate your um, embrace of realism. It can be hard. Um, in the art world, I, mean, I think it started somewhere in the 70s. It was an extra passe to, to paint realistically because, you know, when the, where there's a camera, where, why do you need to capture what is? But it, that's not all we're doing as realist painters. Well, no, and when you look at these environments, these are spaces that come from your consciousness. And I think the thing about all art, if it comes from deep within us and our mm -hmm. stories and our spirit and our love, it's authentic. Yeah. And it's yeah. modern because it's now in your lifetime. But through, through a human lens, you know, there's yeah. no, no mechanism here. I mean, I'm using media and techniques that are hundreds of years old. Describe the techniques. 
So um, a lot of these canvases I've stretched myself and primed with water. Uh, rabbit and linen. Yep, linen. Um, I've primed them with rabbit skin glue, which I is used to do that. The old the school way. I feel a little bad for the rabbits, but it works. And um, then I oil prime them, which is very stinky. <laughs> but we know that. So you never have used gesso. I I have used gesso. It's the like with the panels. Um, there oh, these I can see that. There's some masonite panels, and I'll yeah. gesso those. Um, but on the great canvases. Great gesso yeah. canvases. Yeah, um, oil priming because we don't know yet how archival acrylics and acrylic priming are. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that the old school techniques will last yeah. um, well beyond our lifetimes. So mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting to work that way. It feels like almost being part of a um, tradition. So it's not just like, oh, here's me and my art. It's like keeping something going Keeping something history. alive, yes. Now, do you teach that as well? Um, no, yes and no. Um, I don't teach the, the theory so much, but I do teach academic styles of drawing. Mm -hmm. Where, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, where, I mean, if you look at academic drawings, say from the um, late 19th century, there is this movement. Um, a bunch of artists saw, you know, the young, up-and-coming painters' work at the the Paris Salon, and they were like, "Oh, young people these days, they can't, they can't draw anymore. They have no sense of beauty." So they started to ha um, have students copy um, plaster casts of, you know, Greek statues. They, you know, trying to get students both in touch with how to draw accurately, but how to draw gracefully, and. So when I teach drawing, I, oftentimes I will um, bring the academic techniques to students because it, um, it, it's, it's both about, you have to kind of appreciate the shapes you're drawing. You have to kind of live into them a little bit. Happen. Do you use um, plaster models? I have. Yeah. So. I love the idea that you are teaching traditionally. And I agree, people should draw. People should be able to enjoy just even if they never show it to anybody. Absolutely, and the, I mean, it's, I, I, what, one of my favorite things about it is seeing people surprise themselves with how well they can do. I think a lot of people assume that talent is some magical, mysterious thing that kind of descends from on high, and, and some of it is, some for of you, it, for sure. Some of it, yeah, and for some people you, can, you know that they're coming in with some natural ability, but you know, around all the arts, people kind of assume yeah. you have it or you don't. And there are some things you have or you don't, but boy, there's an incredible amount you can learn. And it also helps people appreciate art and look at art with respect yes, absolutely. and absolutely. Yeah. And so this is, this is a good, good show for young people from the high school and so on. I hope you'll all come. I know some of those kids. And um, this is a place for everybody to come and learn, feel good, be delighted, and working for more work. I want to mention another role you have in life, though, which is <laughs> phenomenal. This um, working in pastel, well, basically chalk, <laughs> on sidewalks and yes. courtyards. How did you get into that? They're beautiful, by the way. I, I've been online. Thank and you. Um, I got into that thanks to Adrian. Um, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, Adrian Tans got me into it. He had a gig up in uh, Burlington he couldn't do and so he passed it off to me the people wanted something 3d I had no idea how to do it my boyfriend at the time helped me um, he was a carpenter and so he had this great mind for math and measuring and you know I never had much patience <laughs> for <laughs> math and measuring um, but I've actually gotten to use the Pythagorean theorem in, in oh, my, my adult life um, um, thanks to working on 3d chalk drawings but it's a, it's been a um, steep learning curve um, yeah. because chalk is so different from oil paint. And one, but one of my favorite things now is that to combine colors, doing chalk um, with oil paint, you mix them together. And with chalk, if you do that, it looks like a muddy mess. But also, the the colors you get are usually not the ones you want, and it's kind of a wonderful challenge because you have to cross hatch the colors so that you kind of see them all at once, and they all speak through each other and make the color. You really neat. Well, these images you can see online. If, uh, her name is spelled K-A-T-I-E-R-U-N-D-E. Mm -hmm. And 
I think for young people out there, too, you, you, you should look, because sometimes we have these events in town, mm -hmm. and you could learn a lot from seeing these and what the possibilities are. Now, you also did a show recently in Amsterdam, and I loved hearing oh. about that. Where this sounded exhausting. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my show, um, but my work is for a show. For, for yeah, yeah. Kind of yep. the very unusual. Explain this. Yeah, I was I was hired by a contemporary artist from New York, a Walid Rod, R A A D. It's a really cool contemporary artist, and his work has a lot to do with story. Um, and when I met him, I was I was very excited to do work for him because I really appreciate what he does. Um, but he needed somebody to p um, copy a, a private collection of drawings and paintings, most of them impressionist. There was one rug. You had to do the rug. I had to paint a rug. And I had to, I had to paint them all on um, life size, on plywood, so such that the eventual um, the eventual show, would, it would look like they were all on the side of storage crates. Oh, interesting. And so I had to paint them the actual size they were, but with frames. So you, the, the painting inside was a painting would be a frame. It would be impressionist. And then I'd have to paint the frame around it such that it looked like a real frame, and then like the shadow was casting and everything. There were 15 different pieces, including a full-size Afghan rug. And Van Gogh. And Van Gogh. And Matisse. <laughs> and Matisse. I love Cezanne's little watercolor sketches. Um, trying to make watercolor out of oil paint and trying to make drawings out of oil paint was fascinating. That was really cool. But I had two months to do all of this. And one of the pieces was so large, I couldn't. it had to be taken apart within the studio to get through the door. Um, so it was an absurd amount of uh, work to do within two so months. So this would have been considered an installation by the artist yes. who hired her. And I think that one of the most fascinating things. That's done a lot now. Yes. And even a lot of artists who are very well known who are in museums. In many cases, their work goes to China. I, I don't know that it will be so much now, but it's been a big um, venue for um, the Chinese to have artists ordering things from little tiny things, you know, like mm -hmm. from Tony Smith's daughter, to huge things that come over on these ships. And I was shocked to learn that when it first began, because they didn't used to announce it. Now they do. But mm. the idea that you are a person creating someone else's concept of someone else's era work. Yeah. When I read about that, I thought, that's a brilliant installation. So you both have to have the credit. That's what I think. Yeah, he, he couldn't he have done it without you. He, that's yeah, great. he gave me credit. I mean, my name was not big up there or anything, but he gave you. Really that's good. good. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of work you've been doing. That was a lot. <laughs> Are we going to get a chance to look at the paintings now? Uh, I loved seeing this when I came to the opening. And I really liked this person. He, he looked gentle. And I particularly like his eye. Mm. And there's a glow. Mm -hmm. And I love the way you painted the hair. That blue is so blush. And it, it's a very limited palette, so it just, on the other hand, it's cool. Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't feel hot. It feels very cool, even the black. Tell us about this okay, painting. Okay, well, okay. thank you. And um, this is a painting I undertook um, for my portraiture portfolio. So I wanted to do a life-size portrait of somebody who is the right kind of beautiful. Um, if you paint somebody who is magazine beautiful, you know, if you think about all like the makeup and the hair, we it's almost like we're trying to make all these people look like each other. There's like a standard of beauty and you, you know, if, if you paint that standard of beauty, it disappears. A lot of people will paint like the magazine beautiful woman, but it's like, no, we've all seen like that's not a person anymore. Um, it's just the standard of beauty. So I wanted to find somebody who was both extremely beautiful, but wouldn't disappear. So uh, out of nowhere, um, I, con I contacted my friend Chris. I hadn't seen him in 13 years. Um, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to just up and be like, I want to paint you because you're beautiful, because that, that would feel a little awkward. So um, I was like, well, your face is cool. Yeah. And he was, he was down with that. He lives in Brooklyn now. So I had to drive to Brooklyn, which was harrowing for a Vermonter. Yeah. Um, 
and spent the day taking pictures of him. And he's a really, really sweet, happy-go-lucky guy, really great. You wouldn't necessarily see the happy-go-lucky in this painting, but when I saw this reference photo in particular, I was like, boom, that's the one. Out of 250 pictures, most of them look terrible because his face is so smooth and has so few lines that it's almost impossible to photograph. But this one was just like, Well, yes. the angle's wonderful. Thanks. Oh, yeah. And it's soulful. Yeah. Like he's questioning you or something, maybe. I, it's interesting. So it, it, like the glow of the light really, yeah. really got me here. We, were, we actually took a lot of time getting the light just right, like packing the window with boxes so the light was coming down the right way. But this clock just happened to be on his wall. And um, I, I, have a, I have enough OCD so that it was really driving me crazy. Um, I finally asked him to just stand in front of the clock. He's not a religious person, so I was just like, you know, I'll get rid of it later, but it makes him glow. And then there's like so the you're whole. Sitting on the light. Yeah, it, for the light. It reminds me of an amuka too, like the, the round, like yeah. icon kind of kind of thing going on. Yeah. And so I was stressing about it for a long time. Actually, do I paint him with the clock or without the clock? It's also like a huge halo. Right. Um, I, because he um, he's very successful. He worked for Facebook for a while, and you know, at 34, he can, you know, do some light freelance work and just have a great time and travel around. And yeah. So what the, pa 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 what the painting wound up being was like a challenge to him as a beautiful soul to be like, are you going to peak at 34? Or are you going to, you know, keep building on this amazing ground that you have? Mm -hmm. So the Wheel of Fortune is I will reign, mm -hmm. Regnabo, I reign, and then I have reigned. And I didn't put the hands on the clock because I wanted him to determine that for himself. Is he going to be here and just head down? Or is he going to be down here and head up? Wow. I like knowing a story like that. Thanks. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have to, but now I'll remember it and it, it, understand it, it, it in a new way. Yeah, it helps. It, it brings a new life to it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I already know because I know you go to the farmer's market in Woodstock, <laughs> which has got the it's like being in Vienna when you look into those yes. windows. But this is so much more kind of American part of the window. Mm -hmm. And Wayne Thibault, who did amazing pastry. It makes you drool when you th even think of them. Yes. He, yeah, he did really, he, like he really found that gorgeous connection between paint and frosting. Yeah. And also paint and soft cheese. He, he painted some incredible soft cheese. Oh, I haven't seen the soft cheese. But, but yeah, if you see a Wayne Tebow in a museum, the paint is super thick. Yeah. And it just feels like frosting. And I love his work so much. He's my favorite contemporary artist. I generally don't get along well with contemporary art, but like well, he was I adore original, him. He was a boring. Absolutely ever. brilliant. Um, and so I, st I, I took, I started painting desserts because of him. He totally inspired me with like, oh, frosting. Yes. And so I paint a lot of frosting now because it's beautiful. So often it's piped in such gorgeous ways that catch the light. And also the paint feels like frosting itself. And it's a lot of fun to paint well, frosting. Well, you know, it, <laughs> I think for any painter, I, he was so popular in oh, mid and late 60s when I was a young artist. And I would, I'm drilling now. <laughs> but what I, what I also felt was that the palette and the texture, like yeah. really, this is like squeezing the paint out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it's the bright colors. Great, yeah. 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 I, I found myself, usually I don't push color anymore because I'm trying to really feel exactly what the light is doing. But when I'm painting frosting, I'll start to push the color because it's nice and deeper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they sit here on this desk, everybody who's watching. So if you come to the mm -hmm. gallery, go to the desk. <laughs> Get a candies. little chocolate. Yes, I am, yeah. Now and then somebody will come in and eat one of my models. I usually have a few mint candies hanging around the studio. Because yeah. you never know when you need like a pop of color. Yeah, that's perfect on the blue. But most of my dessert models do come from the Woodstock Farmer's Market because they yeah. do that really European buttercream. Yeah. And it looks good and it tastes good. So when I'm done with the painting, I get to eat the cupcake. So if I'm burned out or if it's winter and I'm having a rough time, sometimes I'll paint a cupcake just so to bribe myself <laughs> to get through the work day and then go home and eat it. What a good reason. It is. <laughs> well, thank you for showing us that. When I came in, 
and I saw this. I really remembered who Katie was because not not long ago, before this show opened, I had been at a wonderful party at Simon Pierce for a young man who had grown up in Woodstock, the grandson of Nancy Wickham Boyd, who people know well here because she was one of the first artists who did huge ceramics mm -hmm. and imported things from Denmark. Anyway, it was his party. And I couldn't hear very well because I don't hear very well sometimes. This great music was going on and it was conflicting with all the people I was trying to talk to. <laughs> so instead I went over and I stood outside and listened right outside the space where you guys should play music. And that's where I, I heard the other part of Katie. Um, not words, but her music from her saxophone. Mm -hmm. So I like seeing this. Tell us about this painting. So this is actually the saxophone at Eye View. Um, I love the different colored lights. Um, from, you know, playing in bars with the big setup of the lights. I love watching the different colors go by, especially if I'm getting sleepy and my brain is just going, ooh, while I'm, you know, trying to get through a, the, the second set on a Friday night. Yeah. Um, I, I just love seeing how the lights are changing and interacting. And it's hard to photograph, but I happened to get in the middle of a song on New Year's Eve several years ago. I just took a bunch of shots from where I was on stage. And it was a song I wasn't playing, so I got the chance to... Uh, Where were you? This is Salt Hill, Lebanon. Oh, another community area. So yep. <laughs> I see down you the road. at Simon Pierce, and you also play at Salt Hill. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people love going there. Oh, yeah, they've got a great dance floor there. Well, and that's been a wonderful time being with Katie here. I've come in several times because I also volunteer here, as do about 25 other people. This is how this gallery is now going on, and um, Azusa, who is often here, is really the guide behind all this right now, so if you come in, say hello to her, she can answer questions, and so can the volunteers. Do come see this show, though. When does it come down? March 20th. Whoa, so you better get here. Yeah, I gotta hustle. <laughs> it's really worth it. You'll have work here. Anyway, right? We'll yes, I will. There's a wonderful system where artists that are involved in the volunteers will always have work around. And if it's not up, it'll be in storage, and you can ask for it. Yep. This has been a pleasure. Thank you so much.